During the course of our lives, we're going to have to do things alone. There's going to be moments when you are going to go to a doctor's appointment and you'll be by yourself. Uh, there'll be moments in life where perhaps you will have to confront somebody at work. Uh, there may be uh, an issue of immorality or ethics or even a, a legality issue that has to be confronted. You may be in an office meeting of some form or around a picnic table or even during Thanksgiving and somebody is going to look at you and you'll be all by yourself and they'll ask you a very pointed question about your faith or about the Bible and you'll be standing alone. Those moments crop up from time to time where we are going to face some sort of a daunting issue, a confrontation with a child or with a parent and we're going to have to face these moments alone. And what we find is the character of Micaiah is in the same position. He has to deal with an entire assortment of people by himself. And as he does so, he gives us a beautiful example of what it means to be courageous, to stand firm, to experience God's confidence when we go through moments of life in life where we have to face a daunting task alone. First, our second Chronicles, rather, uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 27, we are introduced to Micaiah, the prophet. It tells us here, Now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he allied himself with, uh, by marriage with Ahab. Some years later, he went down to visit Ahab at Samaria, and Ahab slaughtered many sheep and oxen for him, and the people who were with him uh, and in, uh, induced him to go up against Ramoth Gilead. Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he said to him, I am as you are, and my people as your people, and we will be with you in the battle. Moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire first of the Lord. Then the king of Israel assembled the prophets, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for God will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, Imlah's son. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes, and they were sitting at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, the son of uh, Kananiah, made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Arameans until they are consumed. All the prophets were prophesying, thus saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and succeed, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. So please let your word be like the one of them and speak favorably. So Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what my God says that I will speak. When I came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? He said, Go up and succeed, for they will be given into your hand. Then the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his home in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forth and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? He said, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Then he said, you are to entice him and prevail also. Go and do so. 
Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these, your prophets. For the Lord has proclaimed a disaster against you. Then said Achiah, son of Kanani, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? Micaiah said, Behold, you will see on that day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah said, If you indeed return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Listen, all you people. We'll stop right there. We have a plan, we have a prophet, we have some application. As we look at this very potent passage of Scripture, we find that it's taking place uh, in around 850 B.C. The setting uh, requires a little bit of a backdrop here so we understand why this is taking shape. Uh, it is occurring in the northern portion of Israel. Uh, if you look back at Israel's history, we have a series of, of the era of the judges, the kings, and then we have the divided kingdom. Uh, the era of the kings that took place with uh, Saul and uh, David and Solomon, and then the kingdom split. Solomon passed away. And in 930 BC, there was civil war in Israel, and you, you now had what we call the divided kingdom. This is where the story is taking place in terms of the timing. Uh, the northern kingdom consisted of ten tribes uh, to the north, obviously, and then and Judah and Benjamin and Dan were to the south, and that was considered the southern kingdom. Uh, during that time period, the kings that reigned over the northern kingdom historically were all bad. Uh, these guys did not worship the Lord. They did not seek after the Lord. They had no inclination to follow the Lord. Uh, the kings in Judah uh, to the south, some of them were good, some of them were not so good. Uh, but we have uh, a very different political uh, climate in each of these environments when this story unfolds. Ahab, who is uh, reigning over the northern kingdom, he is wicked as the week is long. He is the quintessential politician, always looking out for himself and trying to gain more and more power. Uh, he is so bad, uh, he has allowed for um, Baal worship to continue in Israel. They're dancing around Asherah poles, they're bowing to Baal, they're praying to Baal, they're burning incense to Baal, uh, and he is involved with this, and his wife Jezebel is even worse. Uh, so between the two of them, uh, they're leading uh, the northern tribes astray. Uh, to the south, we have Jehoshaphat, uh, who was actually a pretty decent king. And uh, he has uh, done some very significant things uh, to try to shore up things spiritually for the uh, people of Israel, uh, for the people of Judah. Uh, he has removed a lot of the uh, idols in the land. Uh, he has instituted proper worship. Uh, he hasn't completely expunged the, uh, the territory of idolatry, but he's made some inroads in that area. He's appointed some good judges who are now uh, rendering decent decisions according to the scriptures. But his hallmark, the, the, the claim to fame for Jehoshaphat, which is very significant, was he sent out a bunch of priests throughout the land to teach God's word. Uh, so they had these traveling itinerant ministers who were going town to town, village to village, proclaiming God's word so that people understood how to live their life righteously. Meanwhile, up in, in the northern kingdom, you have Ahab, uh, who, I mean, just to give you a picture of how bad this guy is, um, he, he had a piece of land, and his neighbor owned a garden. His neighbor's name was Naboth, and uh, he wanted the garden. And uh, he, so he offered Naboth some uh, money to buy the garden from him, and Naboth said, no, I, I don't want to sell my land because this is my inheritance for my children, and, and, and that was rightfully so. Uh, so Ahab and his wife Jezebel conspired and had Naboth killed over a cucumber patch. All right? that's, that's how wicked this guy is. So when we step into the story here, we have these two kings. We have Jehoshaphat, pretty good guy, Ahab, wicked as the week is long, and Ahab is buttering him up. He has this huge feast, he has the slaughtering of the sheep and the calves, and, and, and is just really rolling out the red carpet uh, to try to entice him to join him and create another alliance. And this is Jehoshaphat's weakness. Jehoshaphat has allowed his son to marry Ahab's daughter, Athaliah, which is a disaster. You read about that later on in the scriptures. Uh, Jehoshaphat also aligned with the, the kings in the north uh, to create a, 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 a fleet of merchant ships to go sail and make money. And, and that was a disaster. Actually, God um, ransacked the ships and allowed them to crash uh, to teach Jehoshaphat a lesson. So, so Jehoshaphat, this, this is, this is his, his kryptonite, if you would. Uh, he... Uh, likes to please people, align himself with people, and create an unholy alliance with this king. And this is what they're doing. Ahab 
wants to take back a piece of real estate. The Assyrians have been invading to the north, and as that invasion has continued, they were stopped for about three years earlier, and Ahab is, aha, opportunist, this is my moment to go attack and recapture some land that was once theirs. But he wants to use his buddy to the south to foot the bill and bring the soldiers and make sure it's successful. So that's the setting in which this occurs. We find here that Jehoshaphat, being a spiritual guy, says, well, let's pray and seek God's counsel. So what does Ahab do? He doesn't go and find some decent priest or somebody who's a true prophet. He brings prophets of Baal. 400 of them. And they all come together and they proclaim the same thing. They're the yes men of the crowd. Attack and be successful. Why? Because this is specifically what Ahab wants to hear. In fact, Micaiah, or, or Zedekiah, the, the fellow with the horns, uh, he, he, he casts these things and he goes and he's rattling them around saying, you know, with these horns you're going to gar the, or gore out the Arameans. They, they thought there was mystical powers in those things, and that's why he did it. You know, he, he's trying to, to entice him and lure him uh, to go and press on with this attack. And what we find here is a very potent lesson. We could stop right here for a moment. To be wary of the echo chamber. In our lives, as we go forward, as we face conflict and controversy, whether it be in our homes, the workplace, the community, as we face moments where we are alone, we need to be very wary of what we call the echo chamber, where people are telling us what we want to hear. The book of Proverbs explains to us that the wise will help others to become wise, but a companion of fools brings about ruin. In Isaiah, we have a very potent passage whereby Israel had continued to want to surround themselves with those who told them only what they wanted to hear. Isaiah chapter 30 says this, Go now, write it on a tablet for them, Inscribe it on a scroll that the days are coming and it may be an ever, that it may be an everlasting witness. These are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way, get off this path, and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Our first exhortation we find in this is we must be wary of the echo chamber. To hear what we only want to hear and not be willing to listen to true wisdom. When we face situations when we are alone, there is the temptation to succumb to the crowd and go with the flow. Micaiah steps in. We know very little about this man. His name, uh, Micaiah, Micah is the, uh, uh, the root here, and that would uh, convey something to the effect that God, uh, who is like God, and God is a messenger here. And Micaiah steps onto the scene no, we know nothing about him other than the fact that Ahab has had dealings with him before and it's never been good. In fact, he, he, he wants him to swear, according to the Lord, that he's telling the truth because he wants to call God in as a witness because if Micaiah would step out of line, God would deal with Micaiah. That's why he, he does this. And Micaiah initially says what everybody else is going with the flow. Attack, be successful, go after the people at Ramoth Gilead. And... Uh, and then he makes him swear. And now Micaiah proclaims the truth. That this will be the end of Ahab. Now here's the spoiler. If you read the next chapter, it's the end of Ahab. He, he's killed in battle uh, just a short time after this prophecy is made. What's unique about Micaiah, and the reason why I, I, I appreciate this character so much, is I want you to imagine what it would have been like to be him. You have 400 people. That's a lot of people. You have two kings seated in the city gate on their thrones with their robes, all the pomp and pageantry is out there. 
they've, they've slaughtered the sheep, they've got the banquet, everybody's around, and it is a, a, a giant yes concert. Everybody's agreeing, we're going to go, and we're going to take back this land, and they're all on board, and he's this one man, this one voice, this one prophet, who is going to stand against this entire group of people, and not only proclaim loss, but proclaim the destruction of Ahab, and then he speaks against his own prophets and explains to them how God has allowed them to be deceived for the purpose of bringing Ahab to ruin. Where does somebody get that type of courage to face that type of a crowd by himself? And the answer is really quite simple. Micaiah was connected with God. He knew the Lord. He knew his word. He knew that God was faithful. He knew that he could place his confidence in him because God would not back down when he proclaimed something to be true. And that is exactly where the application for you and I comes in today. As we consider these truths, as we consider what Micaiah does in terms of proclaiming and then being persecuted for it on top of it, he is publicly humiliated by Zedekiah by when he slaps him in the face, and then he's chucked in jail with bread and water for the duration. So he not only has to confront these people, but he also has to deal with the implications and the consequences of being honest and faithful and true. So what do we do with all this? First off, we need to be very wary about the echo chamber. To be wary about unholy alliances. The book of Timothy tells us that the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but in order to please themselves, they will surround themselves and gather themselves a great number of teachers who will tell them what their itching ears want to hear. It is important for us to stop and ask the question as we're journeying through life, am I living in the echo chamber? Am I only just listening to one side of the story? Am I boxing out the rest of the truth? We see that this occurs in the Old Testament. We're warned in the New. We see it today. I've literally watched people who've been hearing the gospel and hearing the truth put their hands over their ears. They have no desire. They want to live in the lie. The second warning we have here is to be wary of unholy alliances. Jehoshaphat was stepping into a trap. And we too need to be wary of that as well. The Bible is very clear. Not to be yoked with unbelievers. Now very often we quote that as a marriage passage where we do not want to have a union between an unbeliever and a believer because they're going to be going in two different directions. But that also applies to partnerships, business dealings we have to be careful of, and especially in ministry, whereby we are yoked together and we work together with those who are on the same page theologically, moving in the same direction, biblically. So we have these two warnings to be careful of. But the bigger issue here at hand is how do we find the same courage that Micaiah discovered? And really there's three simple things we can do. Number one is we need to forge that connection with God. And that comes with the gospel. That comes when we come into saving faith and we trust in him and him alone for our salvation. That relationship is the foundation by which we have confidence when we face daunting times, difficult confrontations, conflicts of all sorts. That is where we draw our, our strength. It's not in myself. The Bible is very clear. Curses the one who trusts a man, but blesses one who what? Trusts in the Lord. So what we find here is that we start, if we're going to have confidence to face things alone, it starts with us entering into a relationship with God, and that brings us to the cross. Jesus Christ came as God's Son. He offered Himself as a sacrifice. Perfect, holy, acceptable. 
on your behalf and on mine. He died in your place and in mine so that we could have forgiveness and reconciliation and a restored relationship with God. And if we would turn, be willing to turn from our sin and turn from whatever we're trusting in and trust in Him and Him alone to wash us, to cleanse us, then we'll be restored back to God. And we enter into that relationship and it is in the context of the relationship we find the strength and the ability to face issues alone. Because you see, when we enter into that relationship, we receive the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes the power and the ability to contend with the fears and the factors that are pressing against us in this world. Timothy tells us this, that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but one of power and love and self-discipline. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. I know we have a big picnic coming up. Put that aside. But the kingdom of God is about what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it clear that when you face things alone, you do not have to worry. You're going to stand before governors and kings and synagogue rulers and, and a whole host of people. And there's going to be moments in life where you're going to be the only one in the room standing up for the truth. And you do not have to worry about what you'll say because to whom? The Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need at that moment. In fact, Jesus explained in John's Gospel that the Spirit whom the Father is going to send will lead and guide you in all truth. He will teach you truth. And He'll remind you of the things that you need to know. So we find here that the source of that strength is the Spirit of God. It comes upon us when we accept Christ. He comes into our lives washes, cleanses, and now is that deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And it's through the Holy Spirit we have that ability to now stand in confidence and in courage. I'll give you a quick picture of what this looks like, and then we will land the plane. 1838, a man by the name of Bass Reeves was born a slave in Arkansas. Black man. As he gets a little bit older, he runs away. He spends time out in Oklahoma, out in the, in, in the Indian nations out there, with the Creek and the um, uh, Cherokee and a few, few others. He, he, he mills around and he learns, even though the man never, never learns to read and write, he, he's a brilliant guy, uh, and he learns to speak five different indigenous languages while he's out there in the, uh, in, in the Midwest. He spent some time, they believe, uh, in the Civil War. He was uh, you know, involved in a couple battles, according to historians, uh, heads back out west, and uh, as, uh, as he's now adult, uh, after the war is over, uh, the slaves have been freed, uh, he pursues a field in law enforcement. He's a Christian. He's been going to church all of his life. He's been sitting in a pew just like you have. He's been going and listening to the gospel, listening to the message. He makes a decision for Christ. He accepts Christ. He's following Christ. But he feels he's got this calling that God has placed upon his life to instill justice, to uphold the law. To see to it that the land stays in peace. He learns how to shoot very well. He's ambidextrous. He can shoot the pistol with both hands. And he is the first black man to be deputized as a U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi during the 1800s. Bass Reeves takes this calling and runs with it. He is now in charge of chasing down fugitives, criminals, people who are ruthless, bloody men, and to bring them back to forts and back to justice. And during the span of his 30 years in his career, he apprehended over 3,000 different fugitives, and he did so by himself. He did not like to work with a partner. He liked to move by himself. Every once in a while, he'd employ perhaps uh, an Indian guide to help him through certain territories. But his, his hallmark was to move alone, to sneak into camps and the saloons and the hotels and the towns and the like, sometimes in disguise, and bring people back to justice. He had over, uh, he had dozens upon dozens of shootouts with people. Uh, never was wounded, he had a couple bullet holes in his hat. Uh, according to tradition, uh, he, uh, during the course of his uh, uh, self-defense, he took out 20 guys. I mean, apparently he's a phenomenal shot. But this, this was the thing he did that I found so, so unique. Whenever he'd capture somebody, tie them up and bring them back to the fort or back to the court, he would preach the gospel to them. He had a captive audience, no pun there. 
And he would take these people, these criminals, these fugitives, and as he was marching them back, he would speak about the justice of God and the righteousness of God and also the mercy of God and how God will bless them and help them to turn their lives around if they turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. And during the entire course of this guy's career, that was his hallmark, his claim to fame, is to go out, sneak into these places, find these fugitives, and bring them back and share with them the good news of Jesus while he's marching them back to court. Fast reads. If, he, if you could have this one guy who could run out there in the middle of the bush, chasing out all these fugitives, and do so with courage and boldness by himself and in confidence in God, and if God could give him the strength to do something like that, then he could give you and me the same strength when we're facing difficulties alone. When we're the only one in the room speaking up for Christ. When we're the only one in the office proclaiming justice. When we're dealing with hard times. When we're dealing with difficult news. He will give us that strength to face them. Well, just a side note, some historians, this is kind of controversial, but some historians believe that Bass Reeves was the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. So with that said, as we face daunting times, as we face difficulties, as we face conflicts and confrontations, Perhaps we need to be reminded that God will never leave. He will never forsake us. He is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. And therefore, we do not need to fear when we face troubles alone. Let's pray.